country pairs. You have uh, the uh, Purva Mimansa and uh, Uttar Mimansa, which is uh, Vedanta uh, as a pair. Um, and uh, here, uh, what we discuss are uh, questions related to uh, logic associated with one's practices, which is in Purva Mimansa and logic related to the, with, to the entire question of what reality is, which is Vedanta. Then you have um, uh, Nyaya and Vaisheshika. Nyaya is logic related to uh, verbal expressions, to, uh, to, um, to discussions of what things are. And Vaisheshika is uh, taking uh, atomic structure and then uh, trying to make sense of uh, uh, what physical reality is. But Vaisheshika, in contrast to modern physics or physics in general, the Western tradition of physics, does bring in the observer right in the beginning. In Vaisheshika, you have uh, three uh, categories associated with outer reality. And these are Dravya, Guna, and Karma, which is substance, attributes, and uh, their motion uh, define all that there is to physical reality, which is wonderful, which is quite consistent with uh, physics, uh, modern physics. But then you also have three other categories associated with the observation process or relationship with this physical reality. And these are, uh, these are uh, Samanya, which is universal, uh, Vishesha, which is uh, particular from where Vaisheshika uh, comes, comes in, uh, particular related to uh, the way we uh, experience reality. And then you have Samavaya, which is where an interaction occurs between outer reality and the individual. So in contrast to uh, uh, physics, um, as it has evolved uh, in the uh, Western tradition. Uh, it does uh, bring in the observer very directly into the picture. Now, very sadly, uh, Indian textbooks uh, do not present all of this and they do not also present, uh, in, in contrast to what is in fact totally wrong, I was uh, leafing through a PDF copy of the ninth class book on physics, where in the chapter, this is NCERT, where the chapter on atoms, there is this remark right in the beginning that um, um, Kanada in his Vaisheshika Sutras uh, defined an atom because when you keep on dividing uh, matter, you will eventually end up uh, at the smallest uh, sized atom and that's what it was. And of course, this is not true at all. In fact, the writer of uh, this NCERT book or this committee, they just made it up because nobody, no one amongst them clearly had seen um, Vaisheshika Sutras of Kanada. What Kanada says is that you have four different fundamental anus or atoms and uh, these are related to uh, the four uh, bhutas of Prithvi, Apaha, uh, Tejas, and Vayu, and they are all different. And of these four, uh, two have mass, Prithvi and Apaha, and two do not, which is uh, uh, Tejas and Vayu, and um, which is quite consistent with uh, what uh, modern uh, physics tells us that you have four kinds of atoms, um, proton, um, electron, uh, photon, and neutrino, and two of them do not have mass, and two do. And um, what the Vaisheshika uh, tradition tells us that every material substance consists of all these four atoms. It's not that uh, that gold, for example, it has all these four. When you heat it, so normally you only see the prithvi part of it, which is gross matter. When you heat it. It becomes liquid because, because of apaha. You heat it further, it burns and becomes bright and, um, and uh, shines light. So that's when they 
uh, Tejas atoms uh, shine through or come out um, because you're breaking, breaking it up. And as it decays, that's when the Vayu atoms, the Vayu Anu, uh, leave this uh, object. So therefore, and this is a very, very interesting uh, and uh, logical thing, which obviously uh, Rishi Kanada uh, came to this insight by uh, reflection, by vimarsha, by, by uh, analysis of reality as he could see it. But he also, uh, in the other three categories, uh, spoke of samavai, and uh, which is the interaction between uh, consciousness and uh, between the observer and reality. Now, this is this is extremely important. Uh, also, since I'm speaking at IIT Mumbai, also because uh, we all know that physics is facing a huge crisis. All of uh, physics, when it comes to um, um, cosmological um, uh, scales. Uh, is based only on 0.5% of the observable universe, 95% uh, because uh, physical theories, uh, gravitation, etc., um, uh, Newton's or Einstein's do not uh, are not able to explain the speeds at which um, these galaxies are moving about, or the very fact that uh, the universe is accelerating outwards, and therefore. 95% uh, of the physical universe is supposed to be dark matter and dark energy, of which we have no evidence right now. And the other 4.5% is supposed to be interstellar gases. So all that we are left with is 0.5%. And clearly that could not be the true picture. And in my, my own view is uh, that uh, what we might be just as a hundred years ago, there was a huge crisis in physics. Uh, which was resolved only when uh, the atomic structure of matter was discovered and when quantum theory emerged. Likewise, we are sitting at a huge crisis right now, and perhaps the resolution of it will emerge when the observer is taken or brought into the picture in a much more radical way than was done by either relativity theory or by quantum mechanics. So this is another reason why this needs to come in because after all, um, Vaisheshika is a complementary and view to yoga because I was talking of these, um, these three complementary darshanas. So we already spoke about the two mimansas, then Nyaya and Vaisheshika. And then of course you have Sankhya and yoga Sankhya is a enumeration of different categories of reality, which include both the outer, uh, the, uh, uh, the Tanamatras and the Bhutas and so on, and also the inner, which is where yoga comes in. So yoga is where all of these uh, merging, uh, joining takes place and having through um, other uh, disciplines uh, in the uh, modern sciences, and these disciplines, of course, include all the, you know, the chemistry and the physics and biology and so on, which is all enumeration of categories at different levels. So we've reached a point where we do need to bring it all together and uh, yoga can do it. And so yoga is so much more fundamental than uh, the, uh, the, the common understanding related to uh, physical well-being, the asanas and all that. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we do have these two great uh, classics of yoga, the Yoga Sutra, where uh, yoga is defined as uh, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. And the Vrittis are, of course, thoughts. Um, so you, you calm these thoughts uh, you so as to find out what reality is, because what the thoughts do is to give structure to your experience of reality, which is if one if, if you do uh, have a background in quantum mechanics, you have physical reality, then you interact with it. And so what we uh, observe is uh, a consequence of our interaction with the physical reality, with reality as it is. 
So thoughts are a consequence of our inter interaction with this reality, but we want to go beyond the thoughts because the thoughts are constructed reality. And we want to uh, see what true reality is beyond the thoughts. So this is totally consistent with the picture of quantum mechanics, but it really gives us a means of going beyond uh, where uh, quantum mechanics because of uh, uh, its uh, starting point of very, very limited focus of just uh, looking at physical reality. So we want to go much more beyond it and uh, look at mind, look at physical reality uh, related to the self itself, to the individual itself. And that's why yoga is, yoga includes the whole larger subject of yoga, includes uh, the outer categories. Uh, um, here we, we can bring in Vaisheshika as well, uh, or, 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 the, uh, or the physical system, but then allows one to, to uh, turn one's gaze on the individual himself and be, because there one could ask, uh, shouldn't the body itself be taken as an outer reality? If the body itself is an outer reality, then who is the experiencer? So we're really asking questions which go much further and beyond where uh, uh, Western science or let's call it contemporary science because Western science, as we all know, has also been created by people from India. And uh, let's look at two of different kinds of particles. Well, they're called fermions and bosons and boson is uh, after uh, S and Bose. So clearly what we know of, uh, what we call uh, uh, reality, uh, modern science, has a very important Indian component as well. But what we are doing here is of course to step back and ask the deepest questions. And these, these deepest questions were, um, were, were discussed in the Shastras, were discussed uh, by the Rishis in, in the Darshana and the various uh, commentaries, the Tikas and the Bhashyas and the various uh, practices uh, that emerged. Um, because with yoga, you also have Tantra, for example, and Tantra is a, um, is a, um, is an exploration of the very nature of uh, one's mind and self. So, uh, so all of these things come, come together and yoga is therefore of such uh, amazing scope, uh, scope with promise, for uh, students such as uh, students and faculty, such as those at uh, the IITs and all over the world uh, where, um, as I just mentioned, we are confronting the greatest uh, crises uh, in science, the great crisis of physics, the 95% missing uh, dark matter and dark energy and the great crisis of modern medicine. I don't know whether you are aware of it, uh, about 70 to 90% of all uh, biomedical research which gets published uh, in the best journals of the world is not uh, repeatable. In other words, uh, in recent years, and there have been many, many uh, papers on it. And in fact, I've written a uh, popular blog. You might want to uh, see it on medium.com medium with uh, citations. It's called the reproducibility crisis of uh, modern medicine. So 70 to 90% of research uh, papers, uh, other researchers are unable to reproduce. And uh, why, is, why does that happen? Because of a variety of factors, because of uh, pharma, because of uh, bias, because uh, the researchers are trying to, they have a hypothesis, so they, focus only on such uh, um, observations which seem to support their hypothesis or the experiments are not very well designed um, and, or, um, or um, you are leaving out the subject, the self, the mind. And we also, do, we also do know that there is something called the placebo effect. 
if uh, the patient is told that he's being given a medication and what you really give the patient is just, let's say, sugar pill or something which is totally harmless, the patient, 34% or about thereabouts, will still get well. And in fact, uh, there's also something called the nocebo effect. If you um, uh, give the patient uh, a sugar pill, but you tell the patient that the patient is being given a certain medication, then the patient or 30 odd percent of the patient will also develop the side effects associated with this patient, which the patient knows of. So in other words, the mind plays all kinds of tricks with the body, which modern medicine, allopathy does not accept because it, there's no place for, for mind in allopathic medicine. And therefore it's missing out on lots of things associated with physical well-being, and uh, which is why you have all these chronic illnesses related to hypertension and, 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 and many, many others, diabetes and many others, or uh, arthritis, which modern medicine is not able to deal with. And you have this situation right now that a lot of people, uh, older people, or maybe even in their 40s and 50s, are taking or popping 10, 15, 20, 30 pills every day. And we don't know what kind of side effects uh, are associated with these pills because all of these medications do have side effects. And therefore we truly face a huge crisis uh, associated uh, with medicine. We have, we have a crisis associated with the understanding of physical reality, with medicine, with the way society is structured, with the way even education is imparted because uh, look at education and what we are doing in all universities is just provide a lot of uh, information to the students without an ability to pick what is relevant from what is not relevant. And all these details are of course forgotten, uh, perhaps um, rightly so after this exams are over and people do not necessarily uh, get any insights to properly navigate their way through um, all the challenges of life. In fact, uh, people have also said that 95% of all jobs that there are in modern uh, economies require no knowledge beyond the Excel spreadsheet, which of course people should be taught in their high school itself, right? And the other skills related to uh, doing things uh, properly or uh, writing, uh, writing um, texts or communicating with others. If that is the case, what are colleges doing? This is another challenge. And we see a manifestation of this challenge in America right now, where all these uh, young people, college graduates are going around, they want to destroy the whole country uh, because uh, of a variety of reasons. They feel that, first of all, uh, uh, at the end of um, uh, this pervasive automation that is taking place, you know, AI led permanent disappearance of jobs. The question of what the meaning of um, um, you know, where is one supposed to fit in at the end of college education? So you want to just pull the whole system down um, and, uh, and there, there will probably not be that many jobs or maybe the whole uh, economy needs to be restructured. And I think all the insights that we need for this major change uh, in um, the West, which is truly facing a crisis, and in countries like China also, where there is this simplistic understanding of domination, which is of course ridiculous because the whole world is a family. You just don't want to grow and occupy this land or that land and fighting with all, all these things. That is, that is very simplistic. So how do, we, uh, how do we expand the human consciousness, not only at the individual level, but also at the societal level, uh, at the political level with insights from yoga because yoga is where the outer and the inner meet. Uh, we talked about chitta vritti nirodha at the personal level, but yoga 
the other great classic of yoga is of course the Bhagavad Gita, where uh, Krishna says, yoga karmasu kaushalam, which tells us how to do everything that needs to be done skillfully, right? That's what we need, um, both uh, in relation to other individuals, as we need to do in personal lives, in relation, uh, um, in societal relations, in relationships between uh, nations. Uh, how do we do it skillfully? That is uh, Kaushalam. Uh, and also uh, how to, um, by turning the gaze inwards uh, at the personal level and also at the societal level, which is where a lot of modern uh, disciplines that have emerged have certainly provided uh, uh, insights which complement this and where one of the driving one of the drivers was the yogic or the Vedic tradition. For example, um, Ashish Ji was talking about anthropology and all of that. And as we know, the whole subject of anthropology was developed um, or the beginnings of it are traced to De Saussure in France. Um, about a hundred years ago. And the motivating um, intellectual framework was the work of Panani, which when Westerners discovered that Panani had done this amazing thing of describing a whole language in terms of 4,000 algebraic rules. And language is one of the most fundamental of human expressions. Now, societal relationships are another language. So they said, well, if we can have rules for vocal expressions. We should also be able to determine the rules for social expressions, which is how anthropology comes in. So, and, and then of course, uh, as we all know, these are all complementing, complementary disciplines. You had Bharata Muni's uh, Natya Shastra, you know, this great, great book where Bharata Muni not only described uh, gesture and acting in a intellectual discipline, but also music. Uh, and so it was music. And, and of course, uh, the way you communicate on theater. So, uh, so all of this is also subject to sciences. So what we normally see as Western modern social sciences have an Indian uh, genesis, which people in India, sadly, in my view, are not aware of. And I think it's good to be aware of it and also enrich it because all of these disciplines have also gotten stuck in, in, um, in grooves uh, and uh, you need to um, sort of re-energize them, but going back to the original texts by going back to the insights of the rishis because the insights of the rishis are valuable because they are connected still to the infinite, to the Atman. The Western disciplines, although they took inspiration from here, became finite, limited structures. And you do need to keep on going back to the source uh, to enrich it. And uh, which is how, uh, you know, in, uh, which is how uh, in psychology itself, in fact, uh, uh, there are people that, uh, who argue, these are uh, leading psychologists that look, psychology is in a crisis because in psychology, there's no place for the self. You're only talking of, um, uh, you know, stimulus response, that here's the stimulus of this individual and you have fMRI, functional MRI, you're looking at where the brain is lighting up, but it doesn't provide you any insight as to who the self is or why something is happening. And therefore you do need to bring in the self again and again and self, the drashta uh, in uh, uh, the, the seer, uh, the self is where uh, the next advance uh, in uh, science will take place. Uh, um, and, and people are aware that that's what needs to be done. That's why there's an attempt being made by researchers from so many different fields to create uh, what would be uh, 
consciousness science, um, we cannot at this point say that conscious, modern consciousness science exists. All that we can say is that we are trying, people from different disciplines are trying to see how it could be created. I was uh, part of uh, this small group uh, which was put together uh, in the United States uh, with uh, some membership from Europe as well. Uh, and this group consists, consisted of, uh, uh, this group consists, consisted of physicists, uh, neuroscientists, doctors, philosophers, and computer scientists, and some policy makers in America, uh, 20, 30 people. And the whole question was, will computers of the future uh, become conscious, um, not necessarily five years from now or 10 years from now, even let's say 100 or 500 years from now. And uh, we had uh, many meetings and, uh, and uh, this whole question of consciousness is truly fundamental from a computer science perspective as well, because if computers become conscious uh, like us, and uh, they will then realize that, hey, here is this, these other conscious creatures um, who are this huge trouble. So let's just get rid of them, right? They won't have any need for us. So clearly the whole world will change. Now, uh, we had many, many meetings um, at, uh, and these were week long uh, workshops um, from morning to night. We had many meetings in the US and also one meeting in Cambridge in UK. And, um, and so there were many different perspectives. And I can tell you that there was a kind of a split. 50% of the people, um, and these were some of the world's leading scientists, believed that computers will become conscious. And their argument was that uh, computers will be able to embody more and more of what happens in the brain. And once they are able to emulate it, when they, once they're able to emulate brain processes beyond a certain degree of complexity, then these machines will become conscious. Uh, now, I, I was not one of those 50%. The other 50% who were inspired, who were connected to Vedanta. In fact, I can tell you that these were all Western scholars. I was the only Indian. And there was this 50-50 split. 50% of them, even though they are all Westerners, intellectually thought that the only thing that made sense was shunyata of Buddhism. So they were connected in their personal lives, uh, although you know they, they, don't, they didn't make any big deal of it, to the uh, Buddhist a tradition of shunyata, that there's nothing. The ground stuff of reality is nothing. And out of that emerges uh, everything, including minds. And the other 50% were connected to Vedanta. And as um, those, those many of you might know that uh, the creator of quantum mechanics himself, uh, the Austrian physicist, Erwin Schrodinger was a Vedantin. He used to always carry um, an Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita with him wherever he went. And according to scholars, um, Vedanta and quantum mechanics are totally consistent with each other. So these other 50%, who were, who knew more of quantum mechanics, et cetera. A lot of biologists or psychologists uh, are mechanistic. They think that bodies or the minds are like machines. And therefore for them to be attracted to the Shunyata concept is understandable. But those who do physics are much more in tune with the whole framework that we have of the darshanas that we have from, from India, the, you know, the, the Vedanta. And, and so um, um, there the observer is always a part. In quantum mechanics, the observer um, in the orthodox Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is always a part from physical reality. In fact, even in Newtonian mechanics, the observer is a part from uh, the physical reality that's being described. And so uh, uh, consciousness then, um, as in yoga, where the self is a part, so the whole uh, physical body, the brain, the, all the processes are a part, <laughs> which 
uh, in the Rig Veda is uh, described through this image of the tree on which two birds sit. One of them is eating the fruit and the other just watches. And uh, this is the image in Kathopanishad or in the Bhagavad Gita of the body as a chariot where the senses are the horses, the buddhi is the reins, the mind is the driver, and the sakshi, the observer, is consciousness, which is just one. And that is Krishna, if you uh, look at the image from the context of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, as the self, uh, as the universal self, or if you are uh, connected to the Shaivite tradition, then, um, then um, Shiva is the name of consciousness within each one of us, or Ishwara, who's the real ruler or enjoyer, is uh, Shiva within us. Or uh, you can also approach it from the perspective of uh, the physical self itself, which is uh, then a Prakriti. And Prakriti and consciousness, Prakriti and Shiva are dual aspects of the same reality. So they are like the coin. On one side, you have Prakriti or the goddess. The, on, the, on the other side, you have uh, uh, Shiva. So Shiva and Uma, Shiva or, and Parvati, or uh, the god and the goddess, uh, whatever, whichever um, lens you want to look at reality from, are dual aspects of the same reality. And so um, then this um, yoga is this recognition at the personal level of these two sides of us, of uh, the fact that we normally, um, the way uh, th that's the part of uh, the growth uh, of the individual, we see ourselves only as our mind and these minds are associations with the outer and therefore we are not in touch with our true self within and that true self um, amazingly of course is the same for all of us and this is um, these these are images showed shown in um, vedanta for example you have one outer sun and the same outer sun can shine in a million different pots of water right you'll see the same disk so and in fact this is an image even schrodinger used uh, in one of his most famous book called What is Life, which was very inspirational to, uh, to Crick, Francis Crick. Francis Crick changed his career from physics to uh, biology after reading What is Life. And as you know, Francis Crick was the discoverer of the DNA, the structure uh, DNA. So uh, there is, uh, you know, all these threads coming together. And it's amazing that all these threads go back um, to this uh, Vedic tradition, to these rishis, which looked at all these problems from so many different perspectives and gave both in the Shastras, gave both an analytical framework um, for one to just sit back and make sense of what the outer is, and then turn that gaze onto oneself and through yoga transform oneself. In fact, uh, yoga therefore is this technology of self transformation to see the God or the goddess within each one of us. It's the most liberating thing that there is. And the physical asanas are just a, uh, a preparation uh, of uh, that sense of well being, which then can be used to go further and explore the very framework of uh, the ways of seeing. Uh, and uh, once, one does, one, once one does that, all kinds of um, capacities become available to us. Because if each one of us, each human being, each sentient being has the same self within, then each sentient being, if only they were to find that self, find that Shiva or Krishna or the goddess within them, be one with that, with the gods within them, will have all the capacities that everybody else has. You know, this is this most liberating and inspirational of, 
of, of uh, ideas that there can be. And I can, of course, uh, speak on this uh, for, uh, for hours and give you examples, which, which will uh, uh, convince you that indeed it's not just storytelling. It's, we are not saying this just because it sounds good to believe in this, but this is what truth is. This is what education should be about. And the, one of the challenges for uh, places like the IITs and every other university and college, and for, for us also as parents and brothers and sisters, uh, is how do we inspire everybody around us to be connected to this great power that is within each one of us? And if we did that, then won't life be so much more wonderful because then we'll see that connectivity within each one of us. And rather than have a world where, which is based on domination and control, uh, which can occur both at the individual level, but also at uh, national level, as we sadly saw recently, like a month ago, uh, uh, in that border skirmish. Um, so how do we then create a uh, world society, which is, uh, which is, um, you know, which gives place to everybody to find their true self. So I'll just stop here. And, um, and you know, any questions that you might have, uh, we'll have some time to deal with them also. I, I, I can't, your, your speaker. Professor Neeraj Kumbhakaran is here. He is a professor in the mechanical engineering in IIT Bombay. Okay. And he, is the one who understand engineering and he, he is ardent practitioner of yoga. Uh, so he will take forward this conversation. Yes. Uh, namaste, Professor Ka. So uh, I'm currently the mentor of the yoga club here. I'm a faculty in mechanical engineering. So uh, I mean, thank you for the enlightening uh, talk. What I wanted to ask is, uh, see, uh, you said that we have understood some 5% of the universe and 95% is still not understood. but Will the remaining 95% be understood by using the same methods that were used to understand the 5%? Because if we keep going with this dichotomy of, you know, this is yoga and this is modern science, this is ancient and this is modern, uh, will we be able to uh, get there? Because uh, do you think it's time for us to go with an integrated approach, a blended approach and, and not have this uh, hard uh, division between say yoga and modern science? Well, uh, good, very good question, Iraji. I'm glad that you are the uh, mentor to Yogastha Club. Uh, excellent question. And uh, the answer to that is that in many ways, aspects of yoga or consciousness, if you will, the observer, right? As in Vaisheshika yoga, you have the observer and the, the body have already been introduced into physics and the physics revolution of the 20th century. You look at relativity theory, the question of the observer. You look at, and, and as you know, if you've read the Bhagavad Puran, you know that all these ideas were a part of the Puranas also. Uh, motion at different rates, you know, time evolving at different rates, etc. Conceptually, we're not saying that physics existed, this physics existed. Conceptually, all these ideas were already there. So uh, the relativity revolution, the quantum mechanics revolution, which I've already mentioned, was self-consciously, uh, uh, by Schrodinger, he claims in his autobiography that the Upanishadic Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahm, this is from the Atharvaveda tradition, was what gave him this, this, this central notion of quantum mechanics that there should be a superposition of all possibilities within this state. So uh, the Vedic and yogic sciences have already transformed uh, science as we know. It's only that sadly in the West, people are generally aware of it. It's sadly in India, because in India, there is this unfortunate thing that happened in the last 40 or 50 years. Indian elite decided to separate themselves from our own tradition. So we don't know in schools and colleges, first of all, <clears throat> what 
this incredible, extraordinary tradition is. And secondly, how this tradition has already shaped what we are otherwise taught. It'll be good to know, I'm not saying that we should be obsessed with the past, but it'll be good to know what it is because the challenges that society is confronted with are also enormous right now. But I, to come back to your question, Neeraji, yes, indeed. Uh, what may be the answer, it's not that there is truly 95% uh, of some dark matter residing there. They're being forced to postulate it because they're totally lost. Maybe what is required is a change of, of, of perspective, which is where somehow the observer would come in and we will then know this is a word to the physicists out there. We'll know that maybe the way we are posing this problem is the problem. That it's not that 95% is missing. We are conceiving of physical reality of the cosmos in, in a wrong way, which is why we are being forced to postulate it. Just as uh, um, in certain traditions, um, um, people uh, uh, in their metaphysics uh, is also postulated some uh, jinns, that there are these jinns who do this, right? Because you can't explain various things that are going on. So all these shadows fall away if you look at reality with the utmost clarity. And that clarity is what yoga is all about. How do we have that clarity, not only in our personal lives, and certainly we should have clarity in personal lives, but also be able to see the world as it is outside in all its various manifestations in various locas, you know, the social loca, the political loca, and so on, in with as much of clarity as we can so that we know which way we should be going. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, to add to that, I might say that I mean, to make further progress, certain amount of training in physics, quantum mechanics, a certain amount of training to use the means and the instruments is required. But along with that, a certain upgradation and evolution of uh, consciousness is also required for the person who is doing that, right? Absolutely. And that occurs. Yoga is a process when you turn the gaze inwards. You know, uh, there is this amazing uh, uh, tradition which comes from my part of uh, India, uh, namely Kashmir, it's called the Pratyabhigya, which is the, the doctrine of recognition, that when you turn your gaze and see yourself truly for what you are, then suddenly all the amazing stuff happens. You know, your consciousness itself changes because you thought that you were only this. And now when you recognize yourself for who we are, you know, that Bimba and Pratyabhimba, when you see your image, and that's, that does truly, as you point out, that truly changes, or, or let's go back to the yoga categories from, from uh, Yoga Sutra itself. You have, uh, you know, you have to eliminate the mala, the, 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 the impurity in the lens of your mind. Your mind is a lens, but it has impurities. It also have, it also has, Vic shaper, right? It has turbulence. It also has avaran. It has covering. So as you eliminate the covering, you are arriving at higher levels of consciousness because you're a higher level of consciousness. What it really means is that you have more clarity. If you have, it's like you're walking in the dark. It's the sun hasn't come up. It's not the dawn is yet to really show up. And so you can't see things very clearly. As the light becomes, the light floods the place, then you can see things for what they are. So that is what higher levels of consciousness are. So how do we allow the light to flood in? And my thing would be that, you know, you have these, there's really nothing in the world as extraordinary as these texts, including the central, um, challenge of modern science, of science, is how do we have freedom? If <clears throat> physical laws <clears throat> govern everything that happens, then we can only be robots, right? We are, we, are, we are like machines. Then how do we have freedom? This question was also a part of the Vedic and yogic tradition and discussion in India for centuries. And there was a resolution that came up centuries ago. 
and that resolution was the so called drishti srishti vada that uh, divinity that atman just by drishti is able to do srishti which of which we have this analog in quantum mechanics which my late friend george sudarshan came up with in the 1970s which is called the quantum zeno effect by observation alone you can change the state of a system by observation alone you can steer the state of a system and this has all been shown in the lab as well so what saddens me is that with all this incredible stuff why don't we do or let people in india indian schools and colleges know of all this incredible stuff yeah. august the club is there doing it but this should be revolutionizing everything and if india were to awaken the whole world will be awakened you know this is that time the whole world in my view is waiting for this rebirth to take place yeah thank you uh, professor kak that was a great uh, discussion thank you <laughs> I see Aditya Agrawal ji is also uh, wishes to ask a question. Aditya Agrawal ji is a PhD scholar. He is uh, IIT Kanpur and I am Bangalore uh, alumnus and uh, currently he is pursuing his PhD in our department in the field of uh, yoga and organizational healing and their connection. So his work is on the field work. Yes Aditya ji please go ahead. Uh Professor Kak ji it is indeed a good fortune to uh, listen to your talk and uh, i have heard several of your talks in youtube but the first time uh, uh, you took out time for the yoga conference so a lot of thanks sir my question is uh, about a unique phenomena in our culture the worship of devi uh, and in all ancient traditions the devi sadhana the worship of mother goddess was there uh, how can we take forward this Uh, this particular idea uh, in the research field it intrigues me this this immense sa devi sadhana uh, okay so the notion of gaia is also seems to be is is there a similarity in the notion of gaia and uh, uh, devi sadhana that gaia 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 is the cosmic cow the same word go go in sanskrit means cow right uh, in yaskas nirukta the meaning of the word go the first meaning is the earth did you know that the animal is only the second meaning it also is light and so on right so the cow is a symbol of the planet earth okay so gaia comes from there but to come back to your question um, aditya ji about uh, the devi um the central notion of uh, uh the central epistemological ground of the vedas is this triple division uh which is by the ved jo hai wo trai vidya kehte hain ved trai vidya isliye hai because there is a, this triple division of bhu bhuva swaha right bhu meaning the earth which is the body uh bhuva meaning the atmosphere or antariksh right between here and the sun or the pranas that is the bhuva and swaha or swar means the sun uh, which is the inner sun or the outer sun now look uh, we are the individual self bhu we are observing it through our mind right so that is the individual self which is accessible to us Uh, and then you have the universal self which you compare to the sun but in between is where the action is which is where which is where prakriti is which is the antariksh or the pranas right and that is the domain of the devi physical reality prakriti is all the all devi you can ultimately go to the innermost secrets only through the worship of the goddess through the devi you know even shankara Uh, in his saundarya lahari eventually goes through the goddess which is true reality physical reality so uh, depending upon at what level you are doing this narrative at the individual level you can speak of the worship worship of the devi but as scientists we can also speak of uh, nature itself study of the nature and people asking what should we do 
I say, well, rather than just sit in your room, go out, walk, you know, nature will teach you, nature will instruct you because nature is who the goddess is. You see that? So it depends on what your personal take is. If your take is that of bhakti, then you might say that, okay, it's my deity, this particular goddess, right? And Saraswati will come to me or, or you know, Lakshmi or whatever goddess you're talking about. Or if your worship is through Tantra, then you want to explore the total inner landscape, the whole structure of your mind, or as uh, represented, for example, in Sri Vidya, right? You go through the various layers of yourself and you ultimately go to the very heart of your being where all these goddesses with, with all their glory uh, have provide you the grace, the prasad of all that, all those siddhis. But within all of that is of course, um, infinitesimal form Shiva, because the more you look for Shiva, all that you are going to see is the goddess, right? Because the, the, you are, you will be spoken through the goddess. And, and because Shiva is you yourself, you know, this is incredible stuff. <laughs> we could do it for hours. It's you. So it depends upon where you stand in your journey, which will tell you, you know, what, what path would be the best for you to, uh, to, to, to sort of expound as an instructor, as a professor. Uh, Adityaji, I, I presume you're going to be a professor. So, or, or as an instructor or teacher or mentor at what level would be the right one for you to uh, connect to others. Thanks very much, sir. Would you like to share something about the, uh, the neuroscientific uh, uh, insights, which is, which is the basic uh, matter of your book? It is out of print. I ordered it a few weeks ago. It's still there a few weeks left for me to receive it. So <laughs> that's what Amijan has said. Probably I'll receive it in the first week of August. It looks like it's out of print and they will be arranging it from somewhere. Which book are you talking about? The Patanjali Yoga Sutra, the mind and the Yoga Sutra. Oh, I can, I can send it to you. I can send a PDF copy. I'll be more than happy to share it with you. Not a problem. I'll, okay. I'll, share, you, I'll share a PDF copy with you. I yeah. have, you know, um, one of my scientific researches is in neural nets. So I've looked a, a lot at it. And uh, uh, neuroscientists have not been able to find a single neural correlate of consciousness. There's no single neural correlate. So it's not, it's not the, the it, consciousness, the conscious self does not reside in any specific location in the mind. I, I, 20 years ago, I wrote another book called The Gods Within. Uh, it's out of print but I can, I, find, I discovered it on the internet, it's somewhere there, and I'll be more than happy to share that with you as well, where I do bring in a lot of neuroscience as well. And in fact, there's some amazing stuff um, which happens uh, in neuroscience. One is you can have Alexia without agraphia. I don't know if you have heard of it. Alexia is where uh, you have a brain injury, you know, there's an accident, brain injury, or a stroke. After that, uh, you go, you, you, a person gets into coma and then finally they recover and everything seems to be fine. But excepting for one thing, they cannot read. You, sh you show them letters A, B, C, D, et cetera, and they see it. Of course, A is like this, but once you, uh, once you show them, uh, if you show it to them later, they are not able to recognize that. So that's called Alexia, they can't read, right? That's a deficit. But can you believe it that many of these people who are alexic due to brain injury can still write. So it's called alexia without agraphia. Isn't that amazing? Counterintuitive. So yeah. brain is this amazing structure, you know, put together. And this is who the de devatas are. The gods within are these various devatas which hold the inner sky up. This truly everything comes together. We need to bring this knowledge to the world. And I'll be more than happy to, after this, I'll share you, I'll send you uh, a PDF copy of The Gods Within as well. And, uh, yeah, and you can share it freely with everybody. You know, this is all knowledge is to be shared with everybody. Great. Thanks very much, sir. Thank uh, you. Uh, 
Uh, Ashish, uh, all of you uh, really enjoyed being a part of uh, your Yogastha conference. I, I realized that we need to have more of your lectures, at least in IIT Bombay. Um, you will surely inspire many minds to uh, take ahead this cutting edge work. It's a very insightful work, work which is really uh, trans uh, innovative in nature, which is not just uh, incremental in nature, but really uh, uh, take us to the new paradigm or the, the new perspective of the science. Thanks very much. I'll invite uh, Anish Deshpandeji, who is uh, another core uh, member of the Yogastha team, to propose the word of thanks. Okay, sorry, I was unable to unmute myself. Thank you. No problem, Anish. Right. So, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, well, it's it's been a great three days, and uh, it's culminated in this wonderful exemplary valedictory session. So, thank you, Professor Rikar. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope that everyone here has enjoyed the sessions and the talks. And I sincerely hope that we are all able to take something home, that we can all learn a bit from this experience and leave this conference a little more knowledgeable and a little wiser. So now I'll take this opportunity and present, extend a small vote of thanks. So first of all, I would like to thank the Institute and the director, Professor Shubhashish Choudhury for his continued support in all our endeavors. I would like to thank Professor, Professor Ashish Pandeji and uh, uh, Dr. Sushma Kareji for their immense efforts in coordinating this whole event like talking with all the speakers, the, all this activity that's been going on. So huge, huge thanks to all of you. I thank everybody who has come here, shared their views, presented their wonderful ideas and research on these topics. And I thank the Yogastha team and our faculty mentor, Professor Neeraj Kumbhakarna for his continued guidance. And finally, and most importantly, I believe, I thank each and every one of the participants here today and over here with us for the past three days for participating. It wouldn't have been this success if it weren't for you. So if it weren't for you, if it weren't for your participation and your enthusiasm in genuinely learning about all these wonderful topics. So uh, I'll keep this short and I will wish you all the best, the best of health, the best of well-being, the best of knowledge, everything. So stay safe and thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And I, I will send the stuff to you. We'll wait for that. Thanks very much. Thank you, all of you. I'm quitting the session. See you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Sushma Ji, for your coordination. Yes, uh, thank great you. work. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Chirag.